There's a tiny island surrounded by the stunning clear Red Sea and a bustling underwater world. Zabargad, also known as St. John's Island, has no trees and consists mostly of peridotite, which is rich in peridot. And before you Google it, peridotite is a gemstone that has the nickname the Evening Emerald because of its sparkling green hue. Some historians believe Cleopatra herself loved peridots, and that lady could afford any jewels in the world. Geologists believe peridot forms as a result of the spreading of the seafloor. When the Earth's crust decides to part ways, rocks from deep down get pushed up to the surface. That's exactly how our treasure island formed. The African and the Asiatic continental plates bumped into each other, and rocks in the lower crust went above sea level. Peridot also comes from meteorites that have crashed into Earth, but that's really rare. Its color ranges from a brown-green color to yellowish-green to pure green. Yellowish-green is the most common shade you'll see in jewelry. This color is possible thanks to a good amount of iron in the stone. The deposits of this beauty are spread all across the world, from Vietnam to Arizona and Hawaii, Tanzania, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and Norway. And then, of course, there's a Bargod. So, this place is geologically unique as it's an island built of uplifted mantle, and it's also the oldest and longest known source of peridots in the world. The first people came here for the gemstones many centuries ago. Famous Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder mentioned in his writings that pirates had discovered Zabargod's treasures in the year 500 before the current era. The beautiful green rocks made their way to Queen Bernice of the Roman Empire. They came from the ancient trading port Berenike on the edge of Egypt's eastern desert. When the city fell in the 6th century, all work stopped and the island with all its treasures stood alone for hundreds of years. In the 19th century, British explorers found the beautiful green island in the Red Sea and figured out it was the one described by Pliny the Elder a long time ago. Turkey did some mining here in the 20th century. Over just four years, they managed to collect over $2 million in peridots. They sent the gemstones to France for cutting. The work conditions on the island were nothing like a tropical fairy tale you could imagine. There was no drinking water for workers, so they had to install a gas-powered water condenser. Now, this territory belongs to the Elba National Park System. Most people come here to see the underwater beauties of the reefs. But if you look above the water, you can still see some beautiful sparkling peridots. If Christmas Island in Australia is on your travel list, plan the trip wisely. If you end up there in October or November when the wet season begins, you won't be able to enjoy a walk around. Red crabs cover the whole island like a blanket. And it's not one of those fluffy blankets you want to wrap yourself into. Over 100 million crabs are on a mission to reach the shore alive, marking a crucial phase in their life cycle. For the majority of the year, these red crabs reside in burrows and rock crevices. They have fruits, berries, fallen leaves, and various organic matter to keep them going. But when the dry season is over and the moon is in a specific phase, they know it's time to go. When they reach the coast of the Indian Ocean after several days of migration, they create deep burrows where females will eventually hatch their eggs. Once the burrows are ready, the male crabs return to the rainforests and the females stay at the beach for at least 12 days to keep the family going. The new parents are so smart, they follow the moon to pick the perfect moment with a milder tide to carry their eggs to the water. Once they hatch, the crabs bring their new family members back inland. There, they wait for the rainy season again to keep the circle of life going. To safeguard this magic, authorities close road in areas where crab migration takes place. Japan has a brand new addition to its archipelago, the world's newest landmass literally popped up in November 2023. This unnamed island is just over 300 feet in diameter. It's made of pumice and tuff left by an undersea volcano that kicked off its eruptions in October. The volcanic hustle has quieted down since then, and the waves are eroding chunks of the newly found land. Without lava flows to create a sturdy protective crust over the soft volcanic debris, the future of this freshly formed island is unstable. 
Similar islands had popped up before but were short-lived and vanished once volcanic activity ceased. An island born in 2021 the same way is still visible today though, so the newborn island might have some life prospects. If not, we're likely to see more territories like this. Japan is super rich in active volcanoes on land, with over a hundred in its collection. If you make friends with the Uros people living in the Lake Titicaca area and ask them for their address to send a postcard, they will have a hard time answering. Their ancestors from more than 500 years ago came up with a brilliant invention to protect themselves from the Incas. They built islands from totora roots and reeds that could be moved away from danger deep into the lake. Totora plants help the local community a lot since it's water resistant and is used for all sorts of things, from building boats to roofs and mattresses. The islets are even edible, and the flowers of the plant they're made of are used for tea. So there are around 120 islets still preserved, and over a thousand people can live on them. From two to six families share one islet home. Since there's no need to run away from the Incas anymore, they need to make sure the islets stay in one place. Every 15 to 20 days, the reeds forming the islets decay and need to be replaced. To prevent constant drifting, locals use eucalyptus rods as anchors, firmly securing the islets. Despite their small size, these islets have two spoken languages. The residents craft their fabric and create stunning outfits. Solar panels provide sufficient power for them to have light and even TVs. The main islet has a radio station, and the locals have embraced tourism. You can make a reservation online and experience the floating life yourself. Some islands pop out of nowhere, and others disappear without a trace. One of the most famous so-called phantom islands is High Brazil off the coast of Ireland. Before you ask, no, it doesn't have anything to do with Brazil. High is a variation of I, which means island, and Brazil comes from the root Brez meaning mighty, great, beautiful in Irish, and it gave the name to one of the local deities. This tiny mist-covered island was first mapped in 1325, but later attempts to pinpoint its exact location didn't come to one result. So, legend has it that the island appears only once in seven years, and even those who claim to have seen it say they had just sailed right through it without bumping into any land. Captain John Nisbet shared the story of how he had not only spotted High Brazil, but got stranded on it with his crew. According to him, the island boasted a castle and was mostly uninhabited. There was even an encounter with an ancient grave gentleman, who shared the island's ancient history over a lavish feast. In the late 15th century, a series of expeditions set sail from Bristol to find the famous island. All attempts failed, and High Brazil disappeared from the maps in 1865. We might never find out if it was there in the first place, but it's a beautiful story anyway. No one expected such a strong storm. It's too dangerous to sail back to the land because of high waves and winds. But suddenly, you notice a small green island nearby. You and your friend are about 25 miles off the coast of Brazil. You were fishing and didn't notice black clouds obscuring the blue sky. You're approaching the unknown island and see a Coast Guard boat behind you. People from there are screaming something to you, but you can't make out the words because of the thunder. They tell us we should stay away from that island, your friend says. Despite the warning, you still sail since there's no other way out. Around the island, you notice sharp rocks sticking out of the water like knives in the dark. Now you realize what the Coast Guard warned about, but it's too late! Your boat hits a rock! The bottom is pierced. You start to sink. The rain and wind are getting stronger. Both of you fall overboard. Then darkness comes. You wake up in the morning because of the scorching sun and a dry mouth. Your friend and the wrecked boat are lying nearby. Apparently, you'll have to wait for rescuers to get out here. Now, in the light of day, you can see how dangerous the island's coast is. It's surrounded by rocks, and you're lucky you've survived. Getting out of here will be difficult. Together with your companion, you decide to look for coconuts and bananas. Your friend goes to the wreckage and pulls out a bag of medicine. 
Then, both of you leave the sandy beach and enter the dense jungle. A couple of steps later, you hear a strange hiss. You see your friend. His eyes are filled with horror. Goosebumps run down your back. You feel something alive crawling under your feet, and there's a lot of it. You look down and notice slithering snakes. There are dozens of them. They wrap around your legs, get into trees. They're everywhere. Don't move, your friend says. I think I know where we are. You want to ask him a question, but fear takes away your voice. He reads your face and answers the question. We're in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, the Brazilian Snake Island. These are not just some ordinary snakes. This is the Golden Lancehead, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. You can find them nowhere else on the planet except for this land. They evolved here naturally, without other snake species intervention. That made their venom five times stronger than the venom of ordinary vipers. They're practically the only owners of this island. Nowhere else in the world will you find such a concentration of creeping reptiles on such a small piece of land. And now, they're glad that two big lunch meals have arrived. There's little chance of survival, but you're gonna try. The first thing you need to do is get out of your stupor and find a thick stick. This is your best tool right now. If you encounter a venomous snake, the best you can do is retreat slowly. But this time, there are too many of them. They're aggressive and hungry. Together with your friend, you fight off the snakes with a stick. But there's more and more of them coming. One of them falls on your shoulder from a tree and bites your neck. The poison instantly enters your bloodstream and affects your muscles. It feels like your body is melting. It becomes difficult to move and your neck swells. Your friend grabs you and carries you deep into the jungle. Here, among the trees, you notice an old lighthouse. Yeah, this building really stands out here. Once a year, the Coast Guard visits it. Your friend breaks down the door and puts you on the floor. You're afraid you won't be able to survive the bite. Fortunately, your friend is a doctor. He injects the necessary medicine and saves your life. You have a few minutes to rest before more danger arises. Your friend tells you that the unique snakes appeared here thousands of years ago. This island was part of Brazil for a long time. Then, massive floods separated it from the continent. This part of the land was cut off from the whole world, which helped the formation of a unique ecosystem inside. Vipers that lived here evolved into golden lanceheads. They quickly became the main masters of the island and destroyed all the other animals. But how did they manage to survive without food? cut off from the whole world. They did it thanks to nature and evolution. This island is a transit point for many birds. They stop here to rest during long flights. These birds become dinner for the snakes. Previously, a snake bite almost didn't harm the birds. They were frightened and flew away, leaving the snake without food. But over years of evolution, the island's owners have developed such a potent poison that one bite was enough for a bird to never take off again. There's also a legend that a pirate hid treasures here a long time ago. And, so that no one would ever find it, he brought snakes to guard his gold. Of course, there's no chest with coins here, but the island is attractive for modern pirates, even today. Golden lancehead snakes are an expensive commodity, so bad people often visit this place to hunt the reptiles. That's why the Coast Guard is always on duty around the island. People are forbidden to visit this place. And even if someone manages to get past the guards, they will have to face the rocks. Only biologists and scientists have permission to study the local fauna. A necessary condition for a visit is a doctor's presence in the team, so they can save people from the snake's poison. So we have pirates and hordes of poisonous snakes. But there's something else that makes the island even worse. At this moment, you hear rustling all over the building. Thousands of little paws are tapping on the walls and floor. You look around and see lots of giant cockroaches. Some of them are half the size of your palm. They crawl under your clothes. You and your friends scream in fear and run out of the lighthouse. Quickly, you reach the shore and fall into the water. It seems that not a single cockroach is left under your shirt. But that's not all. You hear a strange buzzing sound. You look around and see a dark cloud of flying beetles forming in the sky. It's locusts! Thousands of flying insects are heading in your direction. 
To avoid a collision, you dive under the water and wait for the cloud to pass by. You go up to the surface and move to the shore. Fortunately, there are almost no snakes here. You and your friend are afraid to approach the jungle and wait for several hours until rescuers arrive. You're nervously painting a pattern on the sand and make a promise that you'll never revisit this place. Finally, you see the lifeguard boat. You're trying to tell them you got here by accident. They believe you and evacuate you from the island. While you're sailing away, you think about what would happen if many poisonous snakes appeared in a village or a small town. It's difficult to imagine what kind of problems people would face. But in fact, there's no need to imagine anything. There is a place on the planet where locals live next to poisonous cobras, but it doesn't create any chaos. A human can live in peace and harmony with reptiles in that village. Welcome to Shetpal Village in India. This place has a population of about 2,600, and it's located in the jungle. It's hot here. Locals are friendly and responsive. If you go into one of the houses, you'll see something <gasps> that seems impossible. The King Cobra, whose venom is one of the most dangerous in the world, calmly crawls around furniture and eats eggs and meat that people give. There's even a special corner for the reptile to relax from the scorching sun, drink water, and have a snack. People are happy about the cobra, as if it was a pet. In the village, cobras are everywhere. They come into houses and schools, crawl through the streets, and keep company during dinner. The locals consider them full-fledged residents. They adore them. The snakes are also used to people and don't see them as dangerous. The coolest thing is there has never been a tragic case in the village because of a poisonous bite. There's no other place in the world where cobras live in such harmony with people. The Moai statues have been standing tall and proud for hundreds of years. Once, people put an enormous effort into carving these grand sculptures. And then, they just suddenly stopped making them. But why? Let's figure out this mystery. Easter Island, located 2,500 miles east of Tahiti, has an area of 63 square miles. To this day, it's one of the most isolated islands in the world. Once, it was covered with forests, filled with different trees and ferns. But when the first humans came to the island around 400 CE, the forest slowly began to disappear. And starting from 1250 CE, Moai statues began appearing all over the place. People made them from different types of rock, compressed volcanic ash, basalt, trachyte, and red scoria. As it's a volcanic island, these were all the ingredients the creators of the statues had to use. And once the builders completed their work, they covered the statues with pumice. The faces of the statues are different, but they all have distinct expressions with heavy brows and large noses. Their arms are carved into the body. Some have hats on top of their heads. There are nearly 900 statues all over the island. They differ in size. The average height is 13 feet tall, and the largest ones reach 33 feet in height and weigh up to 82 tons. Because the statues have so many different faces, there are theories that they represent and honor ancestors, chiefs, and other important people who lived on the island. But without any clear evidence, it's almost impossible to figure out the true purpose of the Moai. Once, they stood beautifully along the coast, watching over people in settlements. And their backs faced toward the spirit world of the sea. When Europeans first discovered the Moai statues in the 1700s, many of them had already toppled over. And the construction of statues had stopped way earlier than that. Huge amounts of effort were put into making these things. Expert craftspeople spent a great deal of time slowly carving the statues with basic picks. A team of up to six people would work hard for an entire year to make just one statue. Then they often had to transport it to its special place on the island, as far as 11 miles. With the help of carbon dating, experts have managed to figure out that the statues started to appear in 1250 CE. And then, suddenly, in 1500 CE or so, the process just stopped. The creators of the statue just left their stone chisels where they were last used. And only a quarter of all the statues were actually placed where they were supposed to be. Half of them still remained in the quarry, while others were left on the ground mid-transit. Something happened on the island, and it caused everyone to just lose interest in the statues. 
There are many theories around why it could happen, and they mostly relate to deforestation. Islanders may have used wood to move the statues across the island. They possibly did this with the help of sleds and ropes, or even used logs to roll the statues or canoes to float them. The wood started to deplete eventually. Trees on the island took very long to grow, and rats ate most seeds. People had many uses for wood, and they needed it not only for practical things, but also to create other statues. Another reason why the inhabitants of the island could have stopped building the statues might be that they were busy with other projects. Specialized rock gardens were becoming more common with a growing population. They were great for the soil, keeping it warm and fertilizing it at the same time. Islanders spent much time and effort making these rock gardens, and there simply wasn't enough time to focus on building and moving the statues. Another theory suggests that what people believed in changed over time. Supposedly, the islands once saw the statues as a connection to their ancestors. After some time, though, rituals depicting a show of strength and endurance became more widespread. And with these rituals, islanders started to carve images related to seabirds. Seabirds became the main animal on the island. People started to believe that their ancestors looked over them through birds instead of the statues, so there was no longer a reason to build the moai. Anyway, these theories might be true. But the main problem was that the small island couldn't support a growing population. What was once a lush land covered in forests quickly became a barren landscape. For the first few centuries, people relied on forest resources. But agriculture became more important sometime after 1550, when forests disappeared. Tribes that once worked together to build the fantastic monoliths focused on competing against one another instead. During this struggle for land and resources, the Moai statues were toppled over because people wanted to reduce their significance. Over the following centuries, all the statues were pushed over, but not all of them deliberately. Many fell naturally after being neglected for so long. Some even ended up in the ocean water surrounding the island. And there they sat for a while. But there was some good news for these statues. They were re-erected, providing a great experience for visitors from all over the world. If you make a journey all the way to this isolated island, the first question you'll probably ask will not be how the statues were made or how they were moved. It will be, how on earth did anyone even make it here in the first place? It was one of the most amazing feats ever. The Polynesians sure did some pretty extraordinary things. From as early as 1500 BCE, these boat-faring people began to explore their world. They used the most advanced marine inventions of their time. They sailed across the ocean in catamarans and outrigger boats, starting in Southeast Asia and inhabiting many more places throughout the Pacific. They lived as far north as Hawaii in 900 BCE and all the way to the south in New Zealand by 1200 BCE. And the farthest journey to the east was, of course, Easter Island. In only a few hundred years, these early sailors inhabited an area of thousands of square miles. They simply memorized where they had already been and, this way, managed to navigate the ocean. They used a wide range of techniques. They watched the sun as it rose and set during the day. Stars helped them at night. If it was overcast and sailors couldn't figure out direction visually, they used other brilliant methods. They watched the movements of ocean currents and wave patterns and paid attention to bioluminescence in the water. These patterns helped them find where specific islands were located. These seafarers even understood how islands and atolls in the distance caused air and sea interference patterns. Birds provided them with certain signs, too. Some of them migrated long distances from one island to another, which gave travelers some kind of a visual connection for their route. Other types of birds had specific feeding times. Sailors knew when and where they hunted and directed their boats depending on where these birds fed. Vikings certainly get way too much credit for their seafaring abilities. Where they used a sun compass, the early Polynesians relied purely on the knowledge of how nature itself could guide them. Their skills were so advanced that in 1769, Captain James Cook, an English explorer, even hired a Polynesian navigator because of his extensive knowledge of the seas. But even more surprising was the fact that he drew a map from memory. It covered an area that was 2,000 miles wide. 
In this region, there were 130 islands, and the navigator knew 74 of those islands by name. At the beginning of their voyage, Captain Cook often disregarded the navigator's advice. But toward the end of their journey, he was very impressed. He also recognized the Polynesians as possibly the most widespread nation on Earth. The Easter Island giant heads are so popular that they even have their own emoji. Their true meaning has been a mystery for hundreds of years. But it looks like we at least know how they were built and transported to their permanent location. The Moai statues consist of three parts. A large yellow body, a red hat or top knot, and white inset eyes with a coral iris. Around 1,000 of them were created. The main bodies of most of the statues were made out of volcanic tuff from a local quarry in what used to be a volcano. The material is easy to carve, but not so easy to transport. That's probably why researchers found over 300 unfinished moai back in the quarry. The rest of them stand in various locations, facing the villages as if watching over the locals. So, it looks like the statues were carved lying on their backs. Then, their creators detached them from the rock, moved them down slope, and set them in a vertical position to finish the work. Once it was done, it was time to get the statue to its platform. Now, if you've ever moved houses, you know how physically hard it is. So, imagine having to move a statue that is about half as heavy as a house without a car or any modern equipment for a distance of 3 miles. The locals must have invented some original way of doing it, and scientists tried to recreate it to guess what it was. They tried pulling Moai replicas on wooden sleds. They thought someone could have used palm trees for that purpose, but this theory has been debunked. The most successful experiment so far was wielding ropes to rock the statue down the road in a standing position. This method sounds real because the local Rapa Noai legends mentioned that the Moai walked from the quarry. And, of course, they needed a good road to get there. In the early 20th century, researcher Catherine Rutledge identified an 800-year-old road network on the island. It was a bunch of pathways around 15 feet wide going from the quarry. She thought that those roads were ceremonial and not built just for the statues. She wasn't a famous scientist back then, so others mostly ignored the theory. Several decades later, famous Norwegian adventurer and archaeologist Thor Heyerdahl published his theory. He mentioned that the roads were built exclusively to transport the Moai and some of the statues were dropped along the roads for some reason. But in 2010, researchers found that the statues weren't randomly dropped. They actually reached their final destinations as they were all set on hidden platforms. Plus, the road floor was U-shaped, so pulling massive statues along them wouldn't be easy. You can still find roughly 15.5 miles of these roads on the island and see them from satellite images. And it looks like Catherine Rutledge was right about them. The roads were probably built for pilgrims to a sacred volcano, and the Moai standing by them were sort of signposts. Halfway across the world in southern England lies another mystery made of stone. A massive sound illusion, a symbol of unity, a burial ground, or more. Scientists are still debating the purpose of Stonehenge. It took Neolithic builders around 1,500 years to construct this beauty made of roughly 100 stones standing upright in a circle. Millions of tourists come to see it every year, and heritage protectors were worried about the modern road snaking close to the landmark. That modern road is now sunk into the ground below the grass level. And even though archaeologists assumed they could find an older road under it, they didn't have any high hopes. But when they took off a layer of asphalt, they noticed two parallel ditches that were nearly perpendicular to the road. The ditches connected the shortened sections of the avenue, 
That's what the archaeologists call the ancient pathway leading up to Stonehenge. It proves that the ancient people used to visit the monument for their purposes, and probably some ceremonies. Another interesting find during a dry summer was three dry patch marks within the stone circle. It looks like they were left there by three massive boulders. So Stonehenge could have been a full circle once. In 2021, archaeologists found a Roman road submerged in the Venetian lagoon. The fact that it runs there on the bottom for nearly 4,000 feet is proof that the Romans were here before sea levels rose and flooded the area. It supports the theory that there was an important settlement here centuries before Venice was founded at the spot in the 5th century CE. The ancient Romans were great at many things, and one of them was building roads. And it looks like they weren't afraid to work on the trickiest terrain. Scans have shown that the ancient road was built right on the beach, and it requires some serious skills. Imagine a village from over a thousand years ago frozen in time. There's still half-eaten food on the tables and personal things left in a rush. It's all preserved so well because it's covered by volcanic ash. Researchers found this village in 2011 in modern-day El Salvador. They believe there was a mass celebration in a Maya village called Serin over 1400 years ago. The whole village was there, preparing the main temple for a ritual when a nearby volcano erupted. The 200-plus residents had no time to rush back to their homes. To save their lives, they had to flee the plaza and run south on a raised road called Sakbe. They managed to escape from the plumes of volcanic ash. In addition to being a superhero and saving all the people, the road had another cool feature. All Sakbe roads had an outer layer of stones. But this one was made of ash. Ironic, isn't it? It proves that the Maya people didn't only use stones to build their roads. Archaeologists discovered several coins in Jerusalem when they were excavating an old street. When they saw the minting dates, they realized the road was built when Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. Since he was the local ruler, it's almost clear that he gave the order to build the road. The pilgrims most likely used this road to reach the Temple Mount for worship. The pathway, which was laid with over 10,000 tons of limestone, was almost as broad as a London bus is long. It had been there for 2,000 years. It's not common that you find such a luxurious road, and it's not clear why a Roman governor would spend so much money on the road. It was probably his attempt to make the city's population like him. Plus, it was a great way to show he had both money and influence. The Old North Trail is an ancient highway that the inhabitants of North America used for 10,000 years first on foot, then with dogs, and finally with horses. The first travelers moved around the continent down its paths for thousands of miles long before the first Europeans arrived, and even during the last ice age. They used it to carry trade goods, visit relatives, find a mate, or just explore. Researchers keep finding evidence that the stories and legends of the Blackfoot Indians about this trail are real. And it could be even the road that served one of the most massive human migrations, the people who crossed from Asia on the Bering Land Bridge about 15,000 years ago and settled in North America might have used the ice-free corridor along the Rockies, which later became a part of the trail. The Nakasendo Highway was built in the 17th century during the Edo period of Japanese history to link Kyoto and Tokyo. The 310-mile-long road runs across mountain ranges and down onto the plain. It was one of the five main roads used by the feudal lords and their families to travel to the capital. There were 69 post stations on the route where travelers could stay overnight. The road was built for horses and pedestrians, as the Japanese didn't use carts you can still walk parts of the route. 
you're going to Ilha de Quiamada Grande, one of the most dangerous islands in the world. There, you find yourself among rainforests, huge rocks, and grasslands. The place is home to birds, locusts, and giant cockroaches. But there's one more animal, and because of it, the island got its notorious reputation. Snakes live there, and a lot of them. So many that the place is also known as Snake Island. Will you survive there? Located just 20 miles away from the coast of Brazil, the island has an area of 43 hectares, or over 100 acres. It probably got cut off from the mainland after the last ice age. The snakes were also separated from most other animal species. They didn't have competitors and had an unlimited source of food. In such a small area, there are up to 4,000 snakes. That's one snake for every 10 square feet. It would be a difficult feat not to come across a snake on this island. Not only is this snake, the golden lancehead, one of the most numerous on the island, but it's also a highly venomous pit viper species. And it's also one of the most venomous in all of Latin America. Its venom is so potent due to the isolation of the species, with only birds sharing the land with them. To catch these birds, the snake's venom needed to become extra strong. And indeed, since they got separated from their distant relatives, their venom has become up to five times more powerful. Most of the time, these snakes hide in the trees or amongst leaves on the ground. If you find yourself stranded here, you'll want to keep yourself a safe distance away. Snakes mainly use their sense of smell and rely on vibrations. If you get too close to one, either stand still or slowly walk away. If you make too many vibrations, this will make them feel threatened, causing them to strike. If you spot them a safe distance away, or if you're walking toward tall grass, stamp your feet a couple of times. This will notify snakes of your presence. They won't risk taking down prey larger than they are and will likely slither away. Carrying a stick is always a good idea, just in case you happen to come across a snake accidentally. This way, you'll have an extension of your arm that cannot be bitten. This simple thing might save your life. A stick with a V-shape on the end will give you even more advantage. Even if a snake starts acting aggressively, holding it down will stop it in its tracks. But whatever happens, don't try to pick it up. Okay, but what if you get bitten? The chances are pretty high on this island, of course. First of all, don't try to get the venom out on your own. Make sure you call emergency services immediately. And once help is on the way, apply a wide bandage. A piece of clothing will do if you don't have anything else. Don't try to chase the snake trying to identify the species. Emergency services know how to figure out what venom it is. Now, just keep calm and wait for help. You might be wondering who you can call on this abandoned island. Well, since it's strictly prohibited to visit this place, there are signs advising to stay away all over the island, along with a number you can call if you run into trouble. Let's say you've successfully avoided getting bitten. The next thing to consider is what you can eat there. Snake Island was previously known as Ilha de Quiamada Grande, where Quiamada is Portuguese for forest being lit up or forest fire. The reason for that was the fact that the entire island was deliberately set on fire to make room for a banana plantation. Unfortunately, the banana business didn't turn out to be a success, probably because farmers got sick and tired of snakes. But some banana trees still thrive today, and they can provide you with some much needed nutrients. You'll also want some protein in your diet throughout your stay. Luckily, along with the snakes trapped on the island, there are also cockroaches. These giant prehistoric looking roaches come out at night to feed on plants. Get that barbecue started and enjoy the rare delicacy this island provides. A great way to survive on the island is to avoid it altogether. If by chance you happen to be sailing past, keep in mind that this place was once connected to the mainland. Rocks beneath the waves are very likely to damage the bottom of your boat if you get too close. Make sure you keep an appropriate distance when traveling past. Sure, this island is intriguing, but please remember that no matter how close you get to it, you won't be able to see snakes from the boat. You can only see these creatures if you get close enough, which you really shouldn't do. And it's not only reptiles that make this location dangerous. Pirates visit the island quite often. 
Not the sea shanty singing peg-legged arbor pirates. But bio-pirates, who come there to capture the very thing that makes it so dangerous. They come there for snakes, to catch them and sell them illegally. Since the island got cut off around 11,000 years ago, the golden lancehead has evolved within its own unique habitat. So, although there are many reptiles on this island, they're still an endangered species. Due to their limited numbers, their value is very high, reaching up to $30,000 on illegal markets, which gives biopirates the motivation to catch them. I can think of better ways to make a living. Anyway, let's say you've got all the resources necessary to survive in one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Do you think you would manage this feat? Perhaps you think it's impossible. You'd be surprised at how possible it can be, if you know what you're doing. It turns out many have visited this scary place before. Research teams often come there. They study the golden lancehead snake, its environment, and its food sources for conservation purposes. But scientists always make sure there's a doctor on the team. There's also a lighthouse on Snake Island. It had been operated by people until the 1920s. Then it became automated. One guess why. Brazilian authorities visit the lighthouse once a year to make sure it's still functional. Locals on the mainland know the reputation of the island, so the stories of people going missing are minimal. But one group of fishers once got too close to the island. As they were sailing along their normal route, they accidentally neared the shore. Their boat hit a rock under the waves and began filling with water. As the boat was quickly sinking, the men had only two options to try to survive in the rough sea or swim to the shores of Snake Island. It was a hard choice to make. After all, they had heard the stories, and it wasn't just about snakes. Rumor had it that the island was cursed. Regardless of the stories, the fishers chose to take their chances with Snake Island. After making it to the shore, they tried to be careful. Their knowledge of the island could help them survive. Most importantly, they knew to avoid the rainforest at all costs. As the men got hungry, they carefully walked along the edge of the forest, warily collecting bananas. They were mostly sitting, waiting, and conserving their energy. They could only drink water when it rained. It was just enough to sustain them. They slept on the beach, unprotected from the elements and weather. And all the time, they were so close to the comfort of the lighthouse or caves. They were probably overly cautious, but it was either enduring some discomfort or risking their lives for a dry bed. They didn't yield to the temptation. They managed to survive for three days without being bitten by a snake. After that, a passing boat finally rescued them. So, now you know, anything is possible. No one expected such a strong storm. It's too dangerous to sail back to the land because of high waves and winds. But suddenly, you notice a small green island nearby. You and your friend are about 25 miles off the coast of Brazil. You were fishing and didn't notice black clouds obscuring the blue sky. You're approaching the unknown island and see a Coast Guard boat behind you. People from there are screaming something to you, but you can't make out the words because of the thunder. They tell us we should stay away from that island, your friend says. Despite the warning, you still sail since there's no other way out. Around the island, you notice sharp rocks sticking out of the water like knives in the dark. Now you realize what the Coast Guard warned about, but it's too late. Your boat hits a rock. The bottom is pierced. You start to sink. The rain and wind are getting stronger. Both of you fall overboard. Then darkness comes. You wake up in the morning because of the scorching sun and a dry mouth. Your friend and the wrecked boat are lying nearby. Apparently, you'll have to wait for rescuers to get out here. Now, in the light of day, you can see how dangerous the island's coast is. It's surrounded by rocks, and you're lucky you've survived. Getting out of here will be difficult. Together with your companion, you decide to look for coconuts and bananas. Your friend goes to the wreckage and pulls out a bag of medicine. Then, both of you leave the sandy beach and enter the dense jungle. A couple of steps later, you hear a strange hiss. You see your friend. His eyes are filled with horror. Goosebumps run down your back. You feel something alive crawling under your feet. And there's a lot of it. 
You look down and notice slithering snakes. There are dozens of them. They wrap around your legs, get into trees. They're everywhere. Don't move, your friend says. I think I know where we are. You want to ask him a question, but fear takes away your voice. He reads your face and answers the question. We're in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, the Brazilian Snake Island. These are not just some ordinary snakes. This is the Golden Lance Head, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. You can find them nowhere else on the planet except for this land. They evolved here naturally, without other snake species intervention. That made their venom five times stronger than the venom of ordinary vipers. They're practically the only owners of this island. Nowhere else in the world will you find such a concentration of creeping reptiles on such a small piece of land. And now, they're glad that two big lunch meals have arrived. There's little chance of survival, but you're gonna try. The first thing you need to do is get out of your stupor and find a thick stick. This is your best tool right now. If you encounter a venomous snake, the best you can do is retreat slowly. But this time, there are too many of them. They're aggressive and hungry. Together with your friend, you fight off the snakes with a stick. But there's more and more of them coming. One of them falls on your shoulder from a tree and bites your neck. The poison instantly enters your bloodstream and affects your muscles. It feels like your body is melting. It becomes difficult to move and your neck swells. Your friend grabs you and carries you deep into the jungle. Here, among the trees, you notice an old lighthouse. Yeah, this building really stands out here. Once a year, the Coast Guard visits it. Your friend breaks down the door and puts you on the floor. You're afraid you won't be able to survive the bite. Fortunately, your friend is a doctor. He injects the necessary medicine and saves your life. You have a few minutes to rest before more danger arises. Your friend tells you that the unique snakes appeared here thousands of years ago. This island was part of Brazil for a long time. Then, massive floods separated it from the continent. This part of the land was cut off from the whole world, which helped the formation of a unique ecosystem inside. Vipers that lived here evolved into golden lance heads. They quickly became the main masters of the island and destroyed all the other animals. But how did they manage to survive without food? cut off from the whole world. They did it thanks to nature and evolution. This island is a transit point for many birds. They stop here to rest during long flights. These birds become dinner for the snakes. Previously, a snake bite almost didn't harm the birds. They were frightened and flew away, leaving the snake without food. But over years of evolution, the island's owners have developed such a potent poison that one bite was enough for a bird to never take off again. There's also a legend that a pirate hid treasures here a long time ago. And, so that no one would ever find it, he brought snakes to guard his gold. Of course, there's no chest with coins here, but the island is attractive for modern pirates, even today. Golden lancehead snakes are an expensive commodity, so bad people often visit this place to hunt the reptiles. That's why the Coast Guard is always on duty around the island. People are forbidden to visit this place. And even if someone manages to get past the guards, they will have to face the rocks. Only biologists and scientists have permission to study the local fauna. A necessary condition for a visit is a doctor's presence in the team, so they can save people from the snake's poison. So we have pirates and hordes of poisonous snakes, but there's something else that makes the island even worse. At this moment, you hear rustling all over the building. Thousands of little paws are tapping on the walls and floor. You look around and see lots of giant cockroaches. Some of them are half the size of your palm. They crawl under your clothes. You and your friends scream in fear and run out of the lighthouse. Quickly, you reach the shore and fall into the water. It seems that not a single cockroach is left under your shirt. But that's not all. You hear a strange buzzing sound. You look around and see a dark cloud of flying beetles forming in the sky. It's locusts! Thousands of flying insects are heading in your direction. To avoid a collision, you dive under the water and wait for the cloud to pass by. You go up to the surface and move to the shore. Fortunately, there are almost no snakes here. You and your friend are afraid to approach the jungle and wait for several hours until rescuers arrive. 
You're nervously painting a pattern on the sand and make a promise that you'll never revisit this place. Finally, you see the lifeguard boat. You're trying to tell them you got here by accident. They believe you and evacuate you from the island. While you're sailing away, you think about what would happen if many poisonous snakes appeared in a village or a small town. It's difficult to imagine what kind of problems people would face. But in fact, there's no need to imagine anything. There is a place on the planet where locals live next to poisonous cobras, but it doesn't create any chaos. A human can live in peace and harmony with reptiles in that village. Welcome to Shetpal Village in India. This place has a population of about 2,600, and it's located in the jungle. It's hot here. Locals are friendly and responsive. If you go into one of the houses, you'll see something <gasps> that seems impossible. The King Cobra, whose venom is one of the most dangerous in the world, calmly crawls around furniture and eats eggs and meat that people give. There's even a special corner for the reptile to relax from the scorching sun, drink water, and have a snack. People are happy about the cobra, as if it was a pet. In the village, cobras are everywhere. They come into houses and schools, crawl through the streets, and keep company during dinner. The locals consider them full-fledged residents. They adore them. The snakes are also used to people and don't see them as dangerous. The coolest thing is there has never been a tragic case in the village because of a poisonous bite. There's no other place in the world where cobras live in such harmony with people. And now for some breaking news. All snakes have suddenly disappeared. If you saw this on the news, what do you think would happen? Well, Voldemort certainly wouldn't be pleased to hear this, and neither would other Slytherin members. Hogwarts would have three houses instead of four. Parseltongue, which is the language of serpents, would become useless. Okay, Potterheads, let's get back to our muggle world. How would it affect us? Well, let's look at the bright side first. People with ophidiophobia, which is the fear of snakes, would be so relieved. We can all agree that snakes aren't exactly everyone's favorite animal. Some snakes are venomous, and this doesn't help save their reputation. It's often overlooked that these animals usually prefer to retreat when you encounter them. They can become defensive if threatened, but when left alone, they don't want to mess with you. Try telling this to people with a phobia, though. Now they can enjoy outdoor activities, such as mountain climbing, like everyone else. And yet, they would have other worries in the absence of these serpents. The design of the ecosystem works like a clock. Every species has an important role. If one goes down, the others will be affected. Snakes are no exception to this order. They primarily snack on mice or rats. They help to control rodent and other small mammal populations. This is important in terms of preventing the spread of diseases, too. Think about the spread of the plague of medieval times. Driving out all reptiles could cause a similar problem. Did you know that the bubonic plague was never completely gone? It's been spotted in modern times, too. For instance, in Madagascar in 2008, so it's good to have some snakes around to protect us from disease outbreaks. You see, snakes are excellent hunters. They ambush their prey by using their highly developed senses to find and track their potential dinner. They're super mobile, can squeeze through cracks, climb on rock walls, and swim. They can even fly. Well, sort of. Flying snakes can't actually gain altitude, but they can glide. They use the speed of free fall and contortions of their bodies to follow air flows and lift themselves. Yeah, they can catch their prey in numerous ways. If we imagine a world without them, it will lead us to another phobia. Allow me to introduce you to musophobia. It's the fear of mice and rats. People with this phobia will have a hard time with all those rats wandering around since there are no snakes to eat them. Not to mention that a single pair of rats can have a million descendants in over a year. Say hello to crop damage. An overpopulation of rodents can lead to a shortage of food and competition for resources. 
Do I feel the Hunger Games vibes? Oh, and mice wouldn't be our only problem. You can add insects to the list too. Again, without snakes, they'll throw a party in the streets. Reptiles also play an important role in the natural environment and food webs as prey. Mongooses, eagles, and hawks would really miss snakes. Eventually, some populations of large mammals would decline, and this could lead to the extinction of some species. Then, there's medicine. Scientists and researchers would miss these creatures. Snake venom is the key to the development of certain medicines. For example, some diabetes and heart disease medicines have been derived from snake venom. Patients who need them will get affected too. When we mention snakes and medicine, there's something else that comes to mind. Botox. Is it really snake venom? Nope. Snake venom used in skin care isn't obtained from the animal itself. It turns out that this ingredient is called snake. It's a human-made ingredient designed to mimic the effects of Temple Viper snake venom. Now let's picture what life would really look like without snakes. I'm starting with day one. People don't immediately notice the absence of these creatures. So, in the first few days, especially in cities, people would have no clue that all snakes are gone. Workers in zoos could start to panic. You would see some news about snakes missing from zoos. Then people in zoo administrations would go through CCTV footage. They would be shocked to see that snakes disappeared into thin air. After the spread of this news, authorities would probably open special departments to see if they have any snakes left in their country. Then it would turn into a worldwide issue. Some sort of a global alliance would be established to investigate what happened to these reptiles and what could be done about it. By the time authorities and people understood the severity of the situation, ecosystems would already start to change. People who live in urban environments may not be directly affected in the first few months. Then they would see more mice in their houses and in the streets. Around 500,000 mice live in the network of tunnels of the London Underground, for example. The number may vary, but many rodents live in large cities. These animals would become more visible. You'd open a kitchen cabinet and, oops, you'd see a mouse looking at you from behind a jar of peanut butter. New career opportunities would arise, since the demand to live in a mouse-free environment would skyrocket. Authorities might introduce new taxes to raise money to handle this new situation. After all, they would need to provide people with safe places to live. Of course, it would be not only urban places that would be affected by the absence of snakes. The countryside would have even more problems. Without snakes, the number of pests would increase. These animals would start destroying crops and habitats of other animals, and farmers would be in serious trouble. Authorities would need to support people living there and find ways to protect the environment, which would be their top priority. Researchers and scientists would have to take a huge responsibility. Maybe they'd create artificial snakes that could be nutritious like real snakes, so that animals like eagles would hunt them and continue to live. What artificial snakes would look like is a mystery. I can't imagine them. I'll just leave it to you. If we flashed forward to five years from the first day of the world without snakes, we would face an entirely different world. Maybe we would have a special day for it, the fifth anniversary of the world without snakes. The changes would be obvious, but by that time, people would have probably got used to living in that different world. Some restaurants would have already made changes to their menus. Goodbye to snake soup. Then there would be new museums dedicated to snakes. You'd be able to read about the story of their evolution and see their fossils. Maybe you'd stop by the museum souvenir shop to buy a snake-shaped pen for your friend. Lastly, we would still be looking for alternatives to snake venom in the field of medicine. 
I mean, it's a relief for people who show allergic reactions to snake bites, but these animals are crucial for some studies and medicines. So, researchers would still be busy trying to find alternatives that could replace snake venom. If we went 200 years ahead in time, we would see a world where people have fully accepted that snakes are gone for good. So much so that younger people would only know that there was an animal named the snake that once lived on this planet. They would get to know this animal from history books and videos. Coloring books would have a cat or a dog, but not a snake. Mythical creatures like Medusa and Shamaran would become even more mystical and interesting. Oh, and we wouldn't compare a sneaky person to a snake anymore. There would be a new definition for them. We've survived the Ice Age, meteorites, and many other challenges, so we'll probably figure something out. Fingers crossed that this scenario never gets real, though. Do you have any other version of how events could unfold in a snakeless world? Warning! Monster ahead! Not the best thing to see written on an old wooden sign at an entrance to a rainforest you just ran into. You're a professional treasure hunter and wildlife explorer. Right now, you're being chased by some mean-looking poachers, but those guys are amateurs. You dart left, hide, then run again. Works every time. Why were those guys shouting so much? Back to business. For several years now, you've been on a quest for a pirate's chest. Inside, a 300-year-old royal medallion. And according to this old map, the chest is somewhere here, in this jungle. Chirping birds, hungry bugs, screaming monkeys, hopefully nothing too hungry. You walk to the river and freeze. Suddenly, total silence. Not a single sound anywhere except the river. Right then, the silence is broken. Something's definitely sneaking up behind you. You turn around and see a long, thick snake's body. You raise your head slowly. Two huge fangs are hanging out right above your eyes, and a long forked tongue is gently licking your nose. On the other end of the tongue is a deep, dark mouth. Looks like a black hole. You'd fit in there no problem. You take a step back and stumble over a rock. You fall. That's the last thing you remember. Then, darkness. Looks like you'll be out for a while. Time to find out what monster you just met. Meet Titanoboa, the largest snake that ever lived on Earth and the largest land vertebrate after the dinosaurs. It's 42 feet long. That's like seven adults or more than half a subway car. And it could weigh up to one and a half tons. All modern pythons and anacondas are descendants of this ancient reptile that lived 60 million years ago. Except for this one, apparently. This snake isn't venomous, but it uses its long fangs to grab food. And its jaw is built for business. Imagine an empty car being crushed by the Brooklyn Bridge. That's what it feels like to be a Titanoboa's afternoon snack. Back to you. The Titanoboa was about to take a closer look at you, but you fell and passed out. The huge snake wasn't expecting its lunch to be quite so willing. It sniffs your body, looks it up and down. Hmm. You're not a threat, so it doesn't need to squeeze you before... The snake opens its wide mouth and begins to swallow. Snakes have a special jaw, divided into several parts. They're connected by ligaments and muscles, so snakes can open their mouth up wide, like motorbike wide. But today, Titanoboa doesn't need to try so hard. Gulp. Titanoboas use their huge fangs to push food down their throats. While it's swallowing, Titanoboa likes to use saliva to grease up its lunch and make it more slippery, much easier to swallow. Bit by bit, you disappear from view. Your clothes are soaking wet at this point. A few minutes later, you've disappeared from view and the snake looks really fat. And that's when you wake up. So how do we know what would happen? Some guy in a full body protective suit actually tried to get inside an anaconda on purpose. Darkness. You open your eyes and take a deep breath. An unpleasant liquid gets in your mouth a bit, and you cough. It's hard to scratch your itchy nose. You're squeezed in from all sides. Titanoboa has a super muscly throat. At first, you panic. What happened? Where are you? You scream, but no sound. 
It doesn't exactly smell great in there. And that's when you realize where you are. You can't see daylight anymore. Uh Uh-oh. Then you feel a weird wiggling side to side. Titanoboas on the move. A python can digest its lunch in a matter of weeks. It all depends on the size of the food. This titanoboa just ate a relatively small snack. Shouldn't take it more than a few hours. But there is some good news. Since you're not that big, you have at least a bit of space to wriggle around in. You reach into your pants pocket. Your clothes, your hands, they're soaking wet. Nasty. Of course, everything else you brought with you is soaked also. Your map, matches, granola bar. Also, there's not that much air inside a massive snake. You need to conserve oxygen. Finally, you pull out your waterproof flashlight. It still works. Looks like a tiny red room. No doors, no windows. Then it hits you. Your phone! You can just reach it. The screen's cracked, but it still works. But you've only got 4% battery. And there's no signal. You think about the signal flare strapped to your ankle. The ones you use to light up a dark cave and stuff. But you can't reach it. You put all your strength into bending your knees, but you just can't. Suddenly, you notice that you've stopped moving. Snakes like to crawl to a safe resting place after eating a large meal. That's when it starts releasing more enzymes to help it digest its prize. You've got one shot to reach the flare. You need to relax your whole body. You stop moving and start to breathe slowly. You feel the walls around you start to relax too. You have one second to bend down and reach for the flare. You go for it. Your hand slides down your leg, past the knee, almost there. You reach your ankle, but there's nothing there. It must have come loose while you were running through the rainforest. A few hours pass. You're well inside Titanoboa's stomach. Snakes have powerful enzymes that can digest all parts of an animal, so it wouldn't have problems dealing with clothes and shoes. You feel around with your hands. Maybe you can find something to help you. A bone from a previous meal? Anything. Your fingers graze over something. A hard, round object. You manage to get the flashlight on it. No way! It's the royal medallion you've been hunting for! This titanoboa must be way older than you thought. It must have had a tasty pirate snack about 300 years ago. How did this snake survive so long? Good diet? Plenty of exercise? There's no chance of escape. You decide to write a final message on your phone. Maybe someone will find it after this whole thing is over. You write that you love your family and have lived a happy life full of adventures. You start to cry, not out of sadness, well, a little bit, but mostly because the enzymes are stinging your eyes. It's done. You put your phone back in your pocket and clutch the medallion tight. You found it! How awesome are you right now? You close your eyes and start feeling kind of sleepy. Then, your phone buzzes. Someone sent you a text. That means you finally got a signal. You call for help and tell them you've been swallowed by a huge snake. You're saved! But they don't believe you and hang up. Just another prankster. You call back, but your battery's done for. A moment later, the snake begins to move again. You hear strange noises coming from outside. What's going on? You can feel the snake's muscles tense up, like it's getting ready to make a dash for it. A few seconds pass, and then the snake suddenly relaxes. You hear human voices. You try to shout, but you're inside a snake. So like, wham! A human hand grabs your head. Another hand grabs you by the shoulder and starts to pull. Someone came for you. You pass through the throat, and after a couple of minutes, the darkness disappears and sunlight hits your eyes. You're saved! Why did you run away from us? We were trying to warn you. Whoa, that guy looks real familiar. Oh, it's that guy who was chasing you earlier. Turns out he wasn't a poacher, he was a local guide. Apparently, locals are always pulling lost tourists out of Titanoboa's stomach. They usually just give the snake something to make it sleepy, then pull, pull, pull. You hug your saviors and thank them for their help. You're never going back to that rainforest, that's for sure. A smile spreads over your face, and you reach into your pocket to feel that sweet gold medallion. No! It must have fallen out! That means it's still stuck in the snake's stomach. You look at the rescuers and ask, you mind if I pop back in there real quick? Back in 2009, people in Ishikawa, Japan, saw a kind of rain...
cherry and as large as a watermelon. During the night, you can see dozens and sometimes even thousands of fireballs. Scientists don't have any solid explanation why it happens, but it's probably flammable gas released by the marshy environment. Still, a local superstition claims it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Tornadic waterspout is a tornado that doesn't occur on land, but on water. The speed of the tornado can be really high. The water is collected and partially pulled up. It manages to pull fish and even turtles up into the air. Actually, raining fish can also be explained by this weather phenomenon. The same might happen on the snow, too, but it's really rare. There are only six pictures of snow spouts, four of which were taken in Ontario. This weather phenomenon requires that the water is warm enough to produce fog while the air temperature is really cold, next to impossible. Lava is red, sky is blue, I'm on bright side, and so are you. Okay, I made that up. But the part about the lava being red can change. That's true, especially if you see the lava flowing from Kauai Jen volcano located in Indonesia. It has a typical red color during the day, but at night, it turns luminescent blue. No mystery behind it, just tons of sulfuric acid. This volcano also has the largest acidic crater lake in the world. The water there is so turquoise, you want to jump in immediately. But you probably already guessed that you should never ever do that. The fire on that volcano is also blue, and it's the largest blue fire in the world rising up to 16 feet. In some places, water may look like glass. White salt ponds might look like windows or even portals to the world underneath. They have their look because of salt evaporation, and such lakes can be found in France and India. But the Cargill salt ponds in the San Francisco Bay Area look even crazier because of vibrant colors. The shades vary. It can be deep blue, grass green, orange, crimson, vermilion, and even magenta. The color difference is all about the different levels of salinity and tiny microorganisms living in those ponds. On the shore of the Baltic Sea in Kaliningrad District, Russia, there's an enigmatic national park called Dancing Forest. The pine trees are all crooked and twisted there. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted to make the dune sand in that area a bit more stable. It's probably the unstable sand that made those trees twist that way. Another reason why those trees are so crooked might be strong winds. Some people claim it has something to do with supernatural powers. They say this forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet. Locals believe if someone climbs through one of the rings in those trees, it'll add an extra year to this person's life. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals crazy since the 1990s. Low-frequency hum doesn't let you sleep normally. Even though scientists tried so hard to find the source of the hum, they failed. They blamed it on mechanical devices and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was related to toadfish. Different variations of hum were also heard in the UK, Australia, and in some areas of the United States. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. Not to lessen clouds, or simply night clouds, are so rare because 1. They only form in summer, and 2. They can only be seen at latitudes between 50 and 70 degrees both north and south. To see those clouds, the sun should be already below the horizon, but the clouds still have to be in sunlight. It's possible for the highest clouds in the atmosphere, which are located about 50 miles up. We can't see them during the day because they're too faint. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are the enigmatic rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. Scientists can't explain why these fungi can form nearly perfect circles. But the superstition claims that fairy dances would burn the ground causing mushrooms rapid growth. In fact, it's partially true. The mushrooms grow in places where a grass withered. The Amazon River, one of the longest on our planet, stretches for 4,000 miles which is more than a drive from Vienna to New Delhi. But there's one river in South America that beats the Amazon River twice. First, it's wider. Second, nobody ever saw it. It's an Amazon underwater twin called the Hamza River, and it runs 2.5 miles underneath. Scientists found it 10 years ago, back in 2011. Don't blink, or you'll miss this rarest weather phenomenon. Red sprites are electrical discharges in the sky that look a bit like an aurora. It's super powerful, about 10 times stronger than any regular lightning, but it lasts just a couple of seconds. 
They were first photographed in 1989, and there are still very few photos and video recordings of this lightning. To make a video that can clearly show red sprites, it should be at about 7,000 frames per second. Well, I'm out. You're hiking in the wilderness, looking for a safe spot to set up camp. All you can hear are leaves and branches crackling under your footsteps. Some squirrels are running up a tree over there. But suddenly, something unexpected happens. You notice something weird in the distance in between the trees. It kind of looks like a concrete structure of some kind. Weird. At this point, you're at least 20 miles deep into the woods, and there are no nearby towns or villages, as far as you know. So you decide to go off the trail with your friends to get a closer look. But as you get nearer, you realize that it's leading to nowhere. Hmm, what's it doing here, in the middle of literally nowhere? And it doesn't even lead to anything. You put on your Sherlock Holmes cap and investigate. So, maybe there used to be an old house or mansion here that collapsed over the years, and the only thing left is a staircase? But, weirdly enough, after circling the bizarre structure, you realize there's no trace of any ruins or even foundations. It's like someone just sliced a staircase off their house, cake style, and plopped it here for no reason. Okay? You and your friends aren't really into getting a whole lot closer. Something feels wrong. The longer you look at this weird structure, the more you feel a super creepy presence. Something tells you you should probably leave the area as fast as possible. As weird as this sounds, discoveries of random staircases illogically found in the woods are surprisingly common. Some are made of wood, others of brick or stone. Some look ancient, while others look like they were finished yesterday. The one thing they all have in common, they all lead to absolutely nowhere, and they're all found in super mysterious locations. One of the most famous ones is in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. A long, medieval-looking staircase made of stones with Roman arches in the middle of the woods. It's believed to have been part of Madame Antoinette Sherry's castle. She was a big singer back in Paris. The castle dates back about 100 years, and it was later discovered again in 1962. This time, there was nothing but a staircase. Another mysterious ancient staircase dates back to 9,000 years ago. It's in a forest in Italy. It looks like a series of stairs that lead to a tiny platform at the top. Now, why go through all the trouble of building the thing if it leads to nowhere? Well, some scientists think it could have been some sort of ritual tower. But your guess is as good as theirs. There's an anomaly in the Indian Ocean known as the Indian Ocean Geoid Low, or IOGL. It produces the largest distorting natural gravitational force in the world. Heavy mineral deposits, many deep-sea trenches, and magma reservoirs disturb the magnetic field in this area. Earth's gravity changes in different places around the planet. It allows researchers to look for patterns and figure out what's happening beneath the surface. Higher gravity fields usually mean denser materials below and vice versa. Some scientists believe that the anomaly might be a dent in the planet's mantle that is working its way up to the crust. The Nihau Island actually rejects the fruits of today's advancements. There are no cars in sight since the locals get around on foot or by bicycles. No wonder their legs have great definition. They thrive without running water, internet, or shops. The only school on the entire island is powered by solar energy with a backup generator. And what's awesome is that it's the only school in the state that's powered by the sun. Being a resident of the island, the local explains some ground rules the permanent residents must abide by. If they do break these rules, they can be evicted. Now, not far from Bangkok, in northeastern Thailand, there's a 75-million-year-old rock formation. These rocks look like three whales swimming together. The beautiful design created by nature became known as Three Whales Rock. Millions of years ago, this area was just a desert. But the land was changing. Gradually, sandstone got pulled apart by the movements of tectonic plates and erosion. That's how these spectacular formations were created. 
If you decide to explore the system of trails around Three Whales Rock, you'll find waterfalls and an abundance of fauna and flora there. Located on Gamal and Gaiden peninsulas, these expansive pit holes were discovered in 2014. They seem to be still changing and evolving. The pits grow wider, and people find them more often. Of course, there's no shortage of theories about how they appeared. Suggestions range from meteorite impacts to the activity of other civilizations. But the most common explanation is that methane gas reacted to water molecules after the planet's permafrost started to melt. This resulted in bubbles of methane bursting through the ice. The craters could be thousands of years old, but nobody knows for sure. You're driving to the state of New Mexico, to the small town of Taos. 2% of the locals hear a strange buzzing in the air every day. Some residents believe the sound is somehow connected with technologies used by guests from other galaxies. Also, there is a theory that something sinister lives in the town. They say Taos is cursed. An evil spirit or a phantom punishes people for something their ancestors did in the past. Scientists still can't explain the nature of this sound. Another theory says it's caused by unusual acoustics of the location, while others think the buzzing is a hallucination. Some can hear it because everybody talks about something, and our minds create an illusion of the sound that doesn't really exist. The sound isn't the same for everyone, either. For some, it's a low hum. For others, it's more of a buzzing sound. But this is not the only place where you can hear the strange noises. It's called the hum, and people worldwide claim to have heard it. Some dwellers of a small village in Scotland describe it as a low, thick hum. Well, some residents of Florida heard a similar sound, too. It's not exactly known where this phenomenon appeared, but the first time the media started talking about it was in the 1970s in England. Also, there are written records of a mysterious buzzing dating back almost 200 years. According to some estimates, only about 2% of people on the planet can hear the hum. Perhaps their ears pick up some low-frequency waves, or the reason is something else entirely. Maybe, just maybe, they hear humming because the person doing it doesn't know the words to the song. Yeah, that joke is also 200 years old. A volcano in Indonesia spews bright blue lava and produces electric blue and purple flames. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano has some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. You can also know you're near it by its foul stench. But I digress. And when sulfuric gases interact with scorching hot air and get lit by the molten lava, they turn blue. You can also find the world's largest acid lake inside this crater. Yep, it's a real stinker. Underwater rivers and lakes are called brine pools for a reason. High salinity makes the water in them denser than the seawater around. That's why it sinks to the bottom, forming rivers and lakes. Those have waves of their own, and these waves can sometimes lap up against the shorelines. If you went down there in the submarine, it would easily float on the surface of a brine pool. But without a submarine, swimming in such a lake would be too risky. They contain too much toxic methane and hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, I'd pass on that too. But hey, be my guest! Cave of Crystals in Mexico is home to the world's most unique crystal formations. Thanks to super-rare conditions in the cave, crystals there grow to unbelievable sizes. The air inside is incredibly humid. The water contains tons of minerals that boost the growth of the Milky White Giants. Some of them are longer than telephone poles. Cylindrical snow donuts occur when a wind gust starts to roll some snow across a snowy area, as if making a snowball. If it was a real thing, it would eventually become too heavy for the wind to move. But a snow donut's center is hollowed out. This happens because its inner layer is too thin and is blown away when the donut is formed. This makes the thing lighter than a snowball. That's also why it rolls further. Unfortunately, snow donuts are rare because they need very precise conditions to appear. The Danakil Depression in Ethiopia is probably one of the most bizarre-looking places you'll ever see. It's dotted with neon-colored hot springs, lava pools, and vast salt flats. 
you've got to be especially careful there. Toxic gases are swirling over hydrothermal fields, and many pools are super acidic. So mm, don't go swimming. Until at least 30 minutes after lunch. (laughs) Just kidding. And finally, there's nothing mysterious about 28,000 rubber ducks found in the sea in 1992. That's when a ship transporting bath toys got lost in the ocean while traveling from Hong Kong to the U.S. Some of these ducks are still floating in the ocean several decades later. They've been spotted in South America, Alaska, Hawaii, and even Australia. And they make bath time lots of fun. Ooh, rubber ducky.